Marvel Universe, it's called the universe for a reason. It's a big place. On film up to this point, we've explored a lot of the ground-based heroes. We're going to a cosmic level before. The challenge is really this combination of the spectacular visual and physical world of Asgard, the world of the gods, with the world of contemporary Earth. Bo Welch, a production designer, did an amazing job. He had a wonderful sense of unique vision, but the source material was always present. He just pushed it to its height, and that's what Asgard was going to need, and the old time, and even Earth. The challenge was other worlds, multiple dimensions. When you sit down and study all the various runs in the comics, they're wildly different from one run to the next, so your visual cues are all over the place. I've got one foot in Jack Kirby land, who generated, I think, the iconic imagery of Thor. I've got one foot in Norse mythology, and I've got one foot in beautiful, perfect, modern, zen-like architecture, so that there's room for these elaborate characters and costumes to breathe. Asgard needs to find a way to capture what Kirby designed and created on the page and find a way to translate that into in, in a wonderful new scale and size that looks amazing on film. And Bo's team did a beautiful job imagining these things, and it was no easy process. I and mean, we went through many, many designers and many, many designs to kind of get us to this place. In talking with Ken, we had decided that Asgard inhabited by warrior gods, but that they live at the top of the nine realms. Their privileged perspective on the universe should be so advanced and elegant that it should not be cluttered with the normal details that we associate human beings with. The technology, the building construction, the methodology of their architecture is so advanced the human brain cannot even comprehend it. This film didn't have a whole lot of green screen. They built this incredibly huge sets could have been very sort of ethereal and just godlike, but they paid a lot of attention to paying homage to the Viking era, which is kind of all the Norse mythology for his based on. I came here and worked around the sets, and I thought, well, that's it. I don't have to do much but just show up and put on the armor and let it happen. The throne room was mind-boggling. That was the scene I'd look forward to, the scene with Loki when he's on the throne. It's such an archetypal image in the comics. And I walked into that set, and I thought, this costume with these horns and, and the spear in this throne, in this room, you've got your shot. You can bring your urgent matter to me. OK. okay. There's a lot of restraint in Asgard so that these very elaborate costumes and bigger-than-life, almost godlike characters have room around them and the focus is on them. There is such a plethora of choices inside the nearly 50 years of Thor comic looks from great artists that you need someone of great taste, I think, to find ways that you can tip your hat to certain inspiring, iconic versions of the characters, but let it live contemporary cinema. So is this how you normally look? More or less. It's a good look. Alex Byrne, a costume designer, she's an Oscar winner. She is unafraid of the sort of theatricality of some of the costumes. Obviously, I started with the comics. I would say the biggest input for Asgard was the original artwork of Jack Kirby. The world he created is amazing. Asgard into that, that singular voice of, this is the expression of Asgard. A good example is, if you saw Sif, you could tell me because of how she looked at she was from Asgard. For the population of Asgard, I wanted to keep the idea of the comic book graphics where he ombres out the crowd and keeps it very monochrome, and that seemed a very good way to keep the population of Asgard present, but not distracting. And we have actors, we have faces, we have human proportions, and the biggest challenge of this is how to make them look like real people, albeit gods, but they're real in terms of not people wearing silly clothes. We're trying to hint at things that are technological and really advanced, but we can't really show them in a way that would make it feel like it was from our world. So it becomes a challenge, and I think that a lot of the stuff that we try to do is just make it a really amazing looking costume. Here are a couple of Thor images that you can see that were done very early on. You can see a lot of the Norse designs that's in it. This is the actual Norse symbol that I took apart, was abstracted into his armor. And then this is the attempt at trying to modernize him, is based off of kind of the ultimate design of Thor. 
more, but smashed in with a modern take of some Norse design. One of the things that we were trying to do was play a lot with fabric weaving in and out with metal, just to kind of give a different feel of Asgard. It's a different culture, a different place, so it's not something that we usually see today, what we wear. I think the most challenging thing was trying to come up with all these characters that had to fit into Asgard. We tried to figure out, did they live here? Were they part of this culture? How much influence did they have from outside? And trying to get that balance, it was a challenging part, but it was also what was fun about the project. One of the things that I enjoyed doing working on this project was being sort of a middle ground between what the comics is, trying to take it into an illustrative realm that adds a little bit more reality to it, and then having the costume designer have that as a basis for them to work from, to actually bring it into reality. The cape is particularly demanding because it needs to look magical. In the comic books, Kirby uses it as a great graphic device for movement and tension and drama. So we needed to have a cape that could have that amount of expression, but also framing Chris's shape and proportion when he's not moving, and then billow and move, fly with him when he's fighting. <laughs> The physicality and the movement is a huge component of these costumes. You can draw fabric till the end of the earth, but we wanted a cape that was going to behave so that it wasn't done in post-production. And we evolved the cape in the workroom, and that fed in with the way the artists were drawing, and we ended up with a cape that does do everything we wanted. It's not done in post-production. Whether you believe in Thor's personal charisma, his character journey, you, you've got to give him an intention. It can't just be sort of swash and buckle. It can't be off oh, for us, God. It can't, it can't be a sort of empty tara. This applies to cape. This applies to helmets. It applies to discs. You have to ask why. You know, okay, so why does he need the cape? Can he tell us a story about his position? Does it help him move better or worse? Does it give a visual signal to other characters? The helmet, well, what's it used for? Is it ceremonial? Is it aggressive? Always find a why. And so uh, Alex Berm is great at doing that. I have to say we have a great team of actors because the clothes are not easy. They do not take five minutes to put on. It's about an hour in the costume. It's just layers and bits and pieces. And the first couple of weeks, we were pouring sweat and dying of these things. Then they came up with these, these cooling vests, which uh, the race car drivers wear, which basically a little vest with pipes that run into the cold water through and can cool you down. I haven't quite counted how many pieces it takes to get this thing on, but it's an incredible, incredible piece of work. I mean, it makes you stand up straight. You know, there's no sitting around in jeans and a t-shirt ordering a frappuccino in this costume. The costumes that we wear are quite hard, so when we walk, we, we don't slouch. We stand up because we physically cannot bend over. <laughs> so that helps. It helps you carry that strength, that, that posture that a superhero would carry. It kind of shifts your center of gravity, so the whole physicality of the character, you know, it's quite a costume. It's the sexiest uh, suit of armor out there, actually. I say that now, but I wouldn't tell that in front of the others because they get upset, but they can clearly see. Now you may be taller, but I'm wider. Helmets. Helmet were the big issue. I've done helmets before, but not on this scale. And that was great because we had digital forms of the actors so that we could sculpt on those because a helmet is so much about the proportion of the face, the eyes, the jawline, because they have to work in close up. In all my fittings, way back, I kept thinking, when am I going to get the horns off? Because it's almost like the last piece of the jigsaw kind of becoming the character. And it's also about the brow, like what it does. Yeah, so it makes you look out from underneath it, which kind of gives you a lot of mischief, you know? <laughs> it's good to have you back. This comes in two pieces, and the back, that's the back piece there. And then this comes off, ah, like that, and it kind of slots together like this. There she is, in all her glory. If you look at a character like Heimdall, the fusion of the worlds that Bo created and the designs that Alex came up with are so seamless, they really feel like they were crafted by the same hand. The head forward, it looks a little more aggressive. You can't really talk about Heimdall without talking about the Rainbow Bridge, because Heimdall's is sort of the tap for turning it on or off and for aiming it to your 
destination. We wanted to find a way to make space travel exciting, necessary to our story. How do you get from one place to the other? And then how do you meet that challenge of perhaps the most colorful and one of the most memorable of images in all the comics is the Rainbow Bridge, the Bifrost, which goes like a sort of motorway or freeway all the way down from the great asteroid island in the sky that is Asgard at the top of the universe all the way down to Earth. We needed to come up with a real bridge, we felt. And then we needed the image and the sort of the symbolic value of a bridge to suggest how energy particulates people or beings and sends them back through. And we wanted that through light energy as well, light en energy that could occasionally evoke uh, a rainbow. And we found that a bridge and rainbows, though those were good, strong, individualist starting points. And then our job was to make it cool. We spent a lot of time generating various versions of what the rainbow bridge should look like. And we looked at it just full on rainbow. We looked at it just moving, pulsing electrical, electron energy. And it's somewhere in there and is never really static. We've sort of locked into a look that relates to the quartz mineral. So if the rainbow bridge was built with quartz, that's very much the light that would be emanating from it. We've also had contact points. So as the Asgardians walk on the rainbow bridge, there's contact and you feel the energy of the rainbow bridge, which I think is a cool effect. In movies, it's good to have a visual or a physical representation of a proper environment that explains what is going on here. This is the portal from Asgard to the other nine realms. This is where the Bifrost connects with the rest of the universe. You need the physical contraption to illustrate it. always played with the banishment to Earth. In early drafts, it was Earth of the Viking era, and we developed that story for a while, but we started to realize the contrast between Asgard and Earth in that case. They were equally alien to the audience, and it didn't work as well. We realized we could open up a whole other avenue by bringing it to contemporary Earth. After you've designed Asgard, Jotunheim, the Rainbow Bridge, Heimdall's, by comparison, Earth's like a holiday. Nevertheless, it has to fit within a cohesive universe within the film. I like the idea of a kind of idealized small town America, in this case a sort of small town New Mexico, with a sort of hopperish kind of quality to the layout of the streets and to some of the buildings and for those shapes to mirror and resonate some of the shapes in Asgard because we needed both to celebrate the distinction between the world and the approaches but also to make all of these images feel as though they belonged in the same movie. What we decided early on was that Asgard and the Nine Realms are up there and they are causing disturbances in the sky. So a small town on a vast desert with a big sky was the concept. And I wanted the little town on Earth into which Thor was tossed by his father to be almost a character so that you would look at this town and its inhabitants and develop some empathy for them so that when Destroyer came to Earth and started blowing it up, you would feel it in your heart. I mean, we wanted to feel real and I think it does. Audiences are incredibly sophisticated. You can't fool them with cheap, synthetic versions of things. Everything has to be brilliantly executed. So Bo has offered dozens and dozens of different ways of looking at Earth. Of course, inspirations from the comics and inspirations from the desert of New Mexico. Really, one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, and there's so many incredible landscapes in such a small area. It's pretty incredible to, you know, have a set where 360 you have beautiful mountains and sort of wide open spaces. Being in the middle of this vastness meant that there's a little bit of Asgard in feel on Earth as well. You know, up there it's an island in the vast sea of space, and down in New Mexico it's an island in the vast sea of the desert. The other thing I was hoping to achieve was to echo the design of Asgard. So on Asgard, you have Heimdall's Observatory, which is the entrance, really, to Asgard across the Rainbow Bridge to a central palace flanked by buildings. In our town, Puente Antigua, we have one street that comes out of the desert flanked by buildings leading to an old car dealership that, in a weird way, echoes the shape of the Asgard Palace. It's a much more modest and the heartbreaking version of Asgard. Nonetheless, I think it visually echoes the other. They built the whole town of New Mexico. A very cute diners and shops and things, a very personal little country town, which was huge contrast to 
the castles and kingdoms in Asgard. In the story, in the struggle between Thor and Destroyer, to me, read like a showdown in a Western town. So I thought, let's look at a Western town. And that led me to the Tom Ford Ranch. We had people that were out there for uh, six months in New Mexico building this set. And the work they did, they took a town that was once Silverado and threw them to Yuma and made it this little real town in middle America that I think anyone would love to be a part of. This town, which as you can see is a western town, we are converting it into a present day town, which is not totally atypical of a small New Mexican town, will be the kind of modern evolution of an old town that perhaps started out looking like something like this one looks right now. It's going to take several months of work to get this to a place where they can shoot it. We're going to start out with basically infrastructure work, putting in sidewalks, telephone poles, street lights, parking meters, roads, the things that make a town modern. And then we're going to recondition the facade, put in signage, and then there'll be a whole layer of set dressing that is really going to bring it to life. The set design, that was just incredible. It made our job so much easier because we were surrounded by all this atmosphere. As you're walking down, you're like, I'm not on a set, I'm not on a set, but you are. It was so incredible, and every time we had to blow up one of the buildings or set something on fire, a little tear just rolled down the side of my face because I thought, I cannot, I cannot see this destroyed. Because we were going to blow this town up, we needed to have all the control we could, and so to be able to build specifically a heightened comic book, slightly more colorful, slightly more lit look than usual for the town of Puente Antigua, was a choice that allowed us the kind of control over the framing of it. Before you go, oh, because we're good on the, on the profile, we're good. Getting into the, 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 the schematics of all of that was, was fun. I think one of the biggest excitements was actually seeing the Warriors and Thor on Earth. Because we'd shot Asgard, we know it works, and then you think, I think I know what it's going to look like, but how is it going to be when these guys start walking through a small town America? Probably the biggest challenge is melding the Asgardian world with the human world, because it's very, very different styles. So we were acting the scenes that are just humans, you know, and we were doing it just like a regular movie. And then all of a sudden we had a scene with Asgardians where, you know, the Asgardians come and visit and they walked off of this very sort of heightened reality. And then the two worlds meeting, we were confused about how we should meet tonally and performance-wise so that we all make each other look believable. That was very strange, by the way. We're looking for Thor and we come right up to the window where we found him. Like, found you! And then the looks on Natalie Portman's face, and Stellan Skarsgård's face, was just looking at us going, what movie are we in? I don't believe it. Oh, excuse me. The Lady Sif and the Warriors 3. And I was glad we'd done the stuff here in, on stage first, because where you inhabit the scale of Asgard, you bring that to Earth, because you were able to sort of have that emotional memory. This is what you've been, you're maintaining, your gods on Earth. Bo Welch has made it very real. He's made two separate worlds identifiable. He's made it so real that you can say, you know what, I grew up in Texas. I've been in a town like that. I've, I've lived in a town like that with the main street and everything. And these sets here in Asgard are something that you could see in your dreams. The film is constantly contrasting. It has a, you know, sort of a beautiful element about from Asgard to Earth, and then from gods in these costumes to Earth people, you know, and human beings. And, and with the fight sequences, you know, you have big dramatic flying and stunts and magic and all sorts of things, and then hand to hand combat, you know, a bunch of guys beating the hell out of each other. The environments that these characters live in just breathe truth and reality and you're in the most fanciful and wild into the modern universe and yet they feel just as real as the room we're sitting in. And what we want to do is bring visuals to the screen that people haven't seen before. Never mind what they've seen in a Marvel movie before, but having not seen in a movie before. At the same time, giving it the Marvel aesthetic of wish fulfillment, of that relatable hero, of a journey of redemption. It's hard with a big action story to really hope that you could claim original or unique images, but I think that the fabric of Thor provides them, and I think that we've been brave enough to meet that challenge and visually to really enjoy the scale and the scope. That was exciting.
Don't forget to like this video and also subscribe to my channel.